You know, I, uh, I came to this country in uh, 1960 and naturally became a member of the American Baha'i community. Uh, went pioneering in 1969 to Colombia, fulfilling a goal of, uh, uh, of the United States and then served this community for some years as a counselor. And of course, all the time in Haifa, uh, the accomplishments of this community was on my mind. That was always there. Uh, but you know, uh, the opportunity to attend a national convention <laughs> never presented itself. So this was a first for me, and for that I'm truly thankful to you, that I could be here. Now, the National Assembly has asked me to talk about the plan, and they left it open, something, say something about the plan. <laughs> and it really, isn't as easy as you, you think, or somebody who has been thinking and living the plan for all these years, because, uh, because really I'm addressing such a knowledgeable group of people. Uh, you're very familiar with the messages of the House of Justice and uh, the consultations these, these days have proven so. It's very clear. And, uh, and I sincerely don't know how, what it is that I can add <laughs> to what you already know from the, your uh, careful study of the, uh, of the messages of the House of Justice. But I will try to say a few words and share with you some ideas and just focus on very few concepts that I think shape the plan. And I hope that that will be somehow helpful to you. It has always seemed to me that, uh, in general, when we think about uh, any stage of the divine plan, uh, we need to have in mind the question of continuity and change. The Baha'i community is accustomed to functioning within the framework of plans regularly received from the head of the faith now for more than eight decades. And a remarkable continuity characterizes these plans. Each plan builds on the accomplishments of the previous one and sets the stage for the more audacious goals of the next plan. And it creates capacity to achieve those goals. One or more or a few or a series of plans usually defines a stage in the development of the faith. And for each stage, the community receives from the head of the faith, initially from the guardian, and now for uh, half a century from the Universal House of Justice, it receives a guidance on the exigencies of the time, what is needed for that special stage, for that special time. And uh, in this way, the community learns to pursue, worldwide community, learns to pursue its God-given mission. Continuity, of course, does not mean lack of move movement. Each stage of the divine plan also demands change. It demands change in the way we approach our work. While 
consolidating what we have learned in the stage, in the previous stages. We learn new ways of thinking, new ways of doing, and even new ways of being. so that we can move forward. This change, which is a natural exigency of growth, usually has to be profound if it is to be meaningful. It can't be some small little thing. And it has to be challenging. In each stage, that which exists in potential has to be realized. And of course, we know that the potentialities with, with which the cause has been endowed are just immense. The present series of plans uh, define the latest stage in the movement of the worldwide Baha'i community. By the time the first plan of this series uh, was being formulated, the community had achieved a great deal. It had established itself in thousands of localities all over the world. It had built its institutions on firm foundations. It had addressed a set of broad objectives, if you remember, especially in the seven plan, seven year plan, having to do with the spiritual life of the individual, with the processes of community life, and with involvement in the wider society. And practically in every part of the world, the community had, for a time, broken out of the limited spaces in which it existed, had taken the message of the faith to the masses of humanity, and had been astounded by the receptivity it had encountered. It had enrolled large numbers into the faith, but unfortunately had found the task of deepening new believers and consolidating emerging communities extremely challenging. Yet it had gained valuable experience from the numerous projects in which it had engaged and the various methods with which it had worked. Therefore, the decision made by the Universal House of Justice and conveyed to the Baha'i world at that time was that the, t the time had come to focus on the process of entry by troops, systematize teaching, and advance the process. This became the single aim of a series of plans that are taking us to the centenary of the formative age. So, there is continuity. It is very clear, a clear continuity can be seen as we see how throughout the plans, through different stages, what had been achieved and what was absolutely necessary to achieve and to come. But then to meet these new challenges, change in certain, certain patterns of thought and action were also required. The most obvious one actually would have to be in the way we understood the concept of the process of entry by troops itself. Throughout the world, entry by troops had become identified with certain methods and materials 
for teaching, enrolling, and to some extent, deepening new believers. It had been identified, it was identified with numbers and with how quickly people would declare their faith. This limited conception had to give way to a broader one that had the idea of capacity building at the heart of it. Now, so this is what we set out to do. Many of the fundamental concepts that made enrollment of large numbers possible were kept. And I think the content of Book 6 of the Ruh Institute proves that. the ability to teach directly when the circumstances de demand it, the qualities of the teacher capable to reach receptive souls and helping them to become confirmed once they accept, the joy of teaching and the rewards of raising the call of kingdom continued to be emphasized. But we all gradually learned to think about a much larger set of issues, without which the process of entry by troops was not going to advance. Among these, the role of education of children had, the, the role that the education of children would play in the process of entry by troops. The fact that junior youth had to be separated, if you wish, from children. And that their immense potential had to be tapped. The way youth were to contribute to, the, to advancing the process of entry by troops. The structures that had to be put in place in manageable geographic units to administer the process of expansion and consolidation, and so on and so on. The list is very long, and everyone here has given so much thought to all these factors that actually make possible to advance in the process of entry by troops. But the point to be made is that the evolution that had to take place in the conception of entry by troops broadening the focus from the act of enrollment without reducing its ultimate importance to the development of human resources and capacity building involved the introduction of concept after concept, the resolution of issue after issue, and learning how to take scores of crucial steps. And when we look at the Baha'i world, only 20 years or so, after 19 years, after the introduction of this series of plans, we are astounded by how much has been accomplished. How much capacity has been built and how much understanding of the process of capacity, of capacity building for large-scale expansion has advanced. And I sincerely believe that when we look at the American Baha'i community, we can also feel proud of its accomplishments in this respect. then we also have to remember that the greater plan of God is at work. A palpable result of the operation of that plan is that in population after population, forces that are tearing apart the fabric of a dying society, of a moribund society, 
are creating receptivity to the faith. The way these forces work is mysterious. On the one hand, they promote cruelty, they cause pain, they bring unimaginable suffering, and they spread despair. But at the same time, in the midst of all this, extraordinary human beings begin to arise. People whose hearts are receptive. People who are willing to work sacrificially to build the world Baha'u'llah has envisioned. People who are really dedicated to their communities, well-being. And this number keeps increasing as if day by day. So, under such circumstances, we may ask ourselves, what else is needed but the capacity of the community of the greatest name to open to them the path of service to the cause and help them take the first few steps as they develop the necessary capabilities, including those needed to help others to walk the same path. I want to pose the question again. <laughs> Given the clear effects on an ever-expanding number of people, effects of that tempest, which in the words of the Guardian is unprecedented in its violence, unpredictable in its course, catastrophic in its immediate effects, unimaginably glorious, in its ultimate consequences. Given the apparent results, what we can see now with our own eyes, of its cleansing force, as he called it, preparing such a vast number of souls to respond to the call of Baha'u'llah, what other focus should we have? What other focus should we have for our collective endeavors but to the building of the capacity of our worldwide community to invite and to make it possible for millions upon millions to walk a path that will enable the community of the greatest name to play its role in the drama that is unfolding before our eyes? What choice did we have? What other plan could we have received given that reality? Now, if this is a fact, if this is the challenge before us, the main challenge before us, then really we need to continually increase our understanding of the nature of the path we are following and learn how to assist thousands of others and hopefully soon millions of others who are willing to join us in our civilization building project, endeavor. Now, to begin, this path that we are going to invite millions of people, we are inviting millions to walk with us, this path cannot be a path imagined by each one of us as sovereign individuals. Nor can it be the path of a small community towards a state of imagined perfection which will, as if by magic, bring the masses of humanity to our doors.
we need to learn about walking a path that will be followed by millions in action. We have to act. We have to walk it. We have to tread this path according to our circumstances. Some walking slowly, some running fast, but everybody walking it. And without either judging each other or creating obstacles for one another. I have a few words here from the Universal House of Justice about this path. You know them. Uh, from a message uh, in which actually it expresses its, some of its reasons for having selected the, uh, the sequence of courses that we are following. The House of Justice says, the main, sequ the main sequence of courses is organized so as to set the individual, whether Baha'i or not, on a path being defined by the accumulating experience of the community in its endeavor to open before humanity the vision of Baha'u'llah's world order. The very notion of a path is itself indicative of the nature and purpose of the course. For a path invites participation. It beckons to new horizons. It demands effort and movement. It accommodates different paces and strides. It is structured and defined. A path can be experienced and known, not only by one or two but by scores upon scores, it belongs to the community. Then the House of Justice goes on and says, to walk a path is a concept equally expressive. It requires of the individual volition and choice. It calls for a set of skills and abilities, but also elicits certain qualities and attitudes. It necessitates a logical progression, but admits, when needed, related lines of exploration. It may seem easy at the outset, but becomes more challenging further along. And crucially, one walks the path in the company of others. Here then is a path being defined by our accumulating experience as we endeavor to open before humanity Baha'u'llah's vision of a new world order. It is a structure so as to elicit initiative. Walking it requires vision and choice. It invites participation and accommodates different paces and styles. And it needs to be experienced by scores upon scores in cluster after cluster throughout the world, then in village after village, and in neighborhood after neighborhood. Friends, this image of a path with tens of thousands, then hundreds of thousands, then millions, treading it offers a very powerful vision of what advancing the process of entry by troops can imply.
and it's a vision that excites us. It is an exciting vision. And it's a real one. It's not a dream. As one walks it, one sees the path exists. <laughs> and by treading it, help define the next, the rest of it. And people come to it. It is proving so easy. Easy for people to come to it. I don't know how easy it is for, for us necessarily to walk it and invite people, but we're learning. The challenge we must meet as we strive to respond to the provisions of this series of plans. This is the last year of one, and then one more at least stays, and then we will see what the House of Justice will give us as the aim of the next series. And this challenge presents itself to us individually and collectively. It's a challenge that demands great spiritual strides and requires rapid development in our administrative machinery. To meet this challenge, we must strengthen the bonds of love that unite us. Without that, as was said so many times after reading the message of the House of Justice, without that love, we cannot do it. The bonds of unity among us have to be strengthened. And we have to establish a very strong sense of community. We must be driven by the desire to help each other, to develop the ability to see each other's strengths and not weaknesses, and be ever watchful so that the spirit of suspicion that is stifling hope in the political, economic, and social spheres of life throughout the planet does not enter into our endeavors. Now, from among the many ideas that have proven to be crucial to the enterprise in which we are engaged, two seem to deserve particular attention learning and accompanying each other on this path of service. And these two concepts are intimately related. In the 2010 Rezvan message, the Universal House of Justice wrote the following. This evolution in collective consciousness is discernible in the growing frequency with which the word accompany appears in conversations among the friends. A word that is being endowed with new meaning as it is integrated into the common vocabulary of the Baha'i community. It signals the significant strengthening of a culture in which learning is the mode of operation a mode that fosters the informed participation of more and more people in the united effort to apply Baha'u'llah's teachings to the, constructions of a to the construction of a divine civilization, which the Guardian st states is the primary mission of the faith. Such an approach offers a striking contrast to the spiritually bankrupt and moribund ways of an old social order that so often seeks to harness human energy through domination, through greed, 
through guilt or through manipulation. In relationships among the friends, then, this development in culture finds expression in the quality of their interactions. Learning as a mode of operation requires that all assume a posture of humility, a condition in which one becomes forgetful of self, placing complete trust in God, radiant, reliant on his all-sustaining power, and confident in his unfailing assistance, knowing that he, and he alone, can change the gnat into an eagle. The drop into a boundless sea. And in such a state, souls labor together ceaselessly, delighting not so much in their own accomplishments, but in the progress and services of others. So it is that their thoughts are centered at all times on helping one another scale the heights of service to the cause and soar in the heaven of his knowledge. This is what we see in the present pattern of activity unfolding across the globe propagated by young and old, by veteran and newly enrolled, working side by side. And this is what you have been talking about for these days. This is not any more foreign to you. It is your experience. And you know it and you see it. But a word of caution. You know, when certain new concepts and words are introduced into our vocabulary, in our enthusiasm, we often tend to overuse them. Passages like the ones that I have just read show how carefully words like learning and accompanying have been employed by the universal suggestion. If we become careless in our use of them, applying them practically to everything, soon we will run out of the vocabulary we need to describe the profound transformation that we are trying to bring about in our lives and in the life of society. To give you an example, for a community that is endowed with such a vast body of teachings about every aspect of life, which is our community, the Baha'i community, with such a splendid vision of a new world order, and with such wealth of guidance on how to serve that vision, living and working in a learning mode must have its own meaning because you know, religions somehow, when you think about religions and learning mode, <laughs> the two things don't seem to come together. If the implications of such a life of service are not examined carefully and we are not constantly thinking about them, contradictions can be created and contradictions always bring paralysis. So, here we are, we have the goal, all of us have the goal to live in a state of certitude. In our common vocabulary, we don't use certitude and learning together. We are to know the teachings and to confidently share with others what we know. 
This is religion. And at the same time, we are to have a posture of learning. So, that posture, for example, cannot be a posture of relativism, the kind of relativism that is so rampant in our society. It cannot imply lack of certitude. We have to walk the path of service with firm steps. Yet, we have to learn how to do this. And we are learning how to do this. We increase our understanding of the nature of the path and take ownership of it as a community when we assist each other in walking it. And of course, we don't do this in the dark. The path is illumined by passage after passage from the writings and by the guidance of the universal House of justice. This is just an example to show that really we do have to think about what we mean we are in a learning mode. What it is that we are learning. And there are many things that we have to learn and we are learning. And how much behind that posture of learning is a state of certitude. Certitude about the efficacy of the teachings of Baha'u'llah, of his vision, assurance that it will be accomplished, that humanity will reach it, and that there is no force that can actually stop it. I think in the same way, when we apply the verb to accompany, to the relationship we establish with each other as we walk the path of service, we need to make sure that we have something very special in mind. Again, just to give examples, uh, this relationship is not one of a knowledgeable person to the uninformed. That accompany, we don't mean that. Maybe language allows that, but that's not what we mean. Of an expert to a novice. Of a teacher to a student. Of a manager to an employee. Of a parent to a child. Of a trainer to a trainee. or of a skillful master to an apprentice. All these relationships exist in society, and they should, in their proper spheres. But that's not what we mean by accompanying each other on the path of service. The image that we have in mind at least, just a summary of it, is two loving friends, two true friends, one more experienced in some aspect of the plan, and not all. Walking together, both learning together as they walk the path. That seems to be more the image we have in mind when we talk about accompanying each other. But then what will happen if those characteristics of those other relationships come into this beautiful relationship and then we still call it accompanying. I'm accompanying you. So, these words, this language, 
has meaning. And again, we are learning it. We won't, our relationships will not be perfect. But we need to think about them. We have to consider so many characteristics of this relationship. The profound love, true respect, generosity, detachment, uh, freedom from the inclination, the natural inclination to dominate, and real disdain for manipulation of any kind. But then here we are in a world filled with jealousy, competitiveness, greed, manipulation, and guilt, taking delight in each other's accomplishments. Learning to detach ourselves from our own opinions. Harmonizing our personal growth with the advancement of the community. Gaining in discipline not to follow the promptings of the ego. Leaving behind any desire for status or power. Striving for meekness and humility when we are called upon to serve on an institution. Accepting wholeheartedly the guidance we receive from our institutions and building communities in which there is faith in the capacity of every individual and where conditions are such that these capacities find collective expression in a vibrant and purposeful life. So this image of millions of people joining each other, accompanying each other on a path of service ends up not being as simple as it seemed at first. It involves transformation from the old to the new. It involves change real change. In a message dated 28 December 2010, the Universal House of Justice refers to this transformation. It says, every follower of Baha'u'llah knows well that the purpose of his revelation is to bring into being a new creation. No sooner had the first call gone forth from his lips, then the whole creation was revolutionized and all that are in heavens and all that are on earth were stirred to the depths. The individual, the institutions, and the community, the three protagonists in the divine plan, are being shaped, are being shaped under the influence of his revelation. And a new conception of each, appropriate for a humanity that has come of age, is emerging. The relationships that bind them, too, are undergoing a profound transformation. Bringing into the realm of existence civilization building powers which can only be released through conformity with his decree. At a fundamental level, these relationships are characterized by cooperation and reciprocity, manifestations of the interconnectedness that governs the universe. In the final analysis, it is these relationships of, we are calling with this innocent word, a company, that are actually real, 
that manifests the universe as it was, the relationships in the universe as it is created. The, the reciprocity that is built into the universe. Those are real. That is real. That as children we didn't know how to establish those relationships, fine. But all these other relationships that everybody writes about and talks about, and it has become accepted that, I mean, without competition you don't have excellence, without, uh, uh, you know, all the things. I, I don't want to go through that. You know, present ideology of the world that we are bombarded with. Those are not real. At best, they're games of childhood. And we are trying, as we walk this path together, to build the real relationships, those relationships that actually are manifestations of the structure of the universe. of how universe was created. How much have I talked? A lot. So, I thought, I, I, I spoke very slowly, that's why it is. <laughs> now, friends, uh, I've just mentioned a few concepts. Again, the list of concepts is many. You know the concepts that shape the, the plan, and we are learning about them. And as I said, it is really just, I don't know what words to use, how, how much joy it brings, at least to all of us, and certainly to me, to see how much understanding there is and how much we have advanced over a very short period of time in this stage of the divine plan. And then we will go to other stages. When the potentialities of this stage are realized, the next stage, with its exigencies. But we have to achieve this one. And we are doing it. So, I would like to bring the talk to an end with a reflection. And I think my reflection may surprise you, but bear with me. The plans we are talking about are global. So every national community does its utmost to contribute to its success. But when it comes to North America, and particularly to the United States, somehow all of us expect more. And I, well, we know why. It's the master. <laughs> There's nothing we can do about it. <laughs> So our first expectation, of course, is that this community carries out the provisions of the plan with unmatched excellence. That's the first expectation. And I, I really think that the rapid, rapid progress that has been made, particularly these past few years, shows that you will, that the American Baha'i community it will fulfill this expectation more and more, year after year. I have no doubt about it. It's, it's very clear. But then, there's the question of destiny of America that exerts itself and is in the back of our minds and it keeps pushing and coming forward and saying, well, what about that? Now, 
I realize that talking about this topic has its hazards. <laughs> we have gone through it many times and we know that. Because approached in a certain way, the concept of destiny can be misunderstood. It can become a right to distinction. It can become a cause of pride. And in subtle ways of a sense of superiority. But those are immature responses to the concept and we can put them aside <laughs> easily, really. You don't have to worry about that. I just had to mention <laughs> that it is hazardous, but the hazards are not that, uh, that bad. Because the destiny, we understand, is something one strives for. It is not a given. But it does carry with it the assurance that striving will meet with stupendous results. So it's not also idle talk. And given the emphatic and beautiful language in which the destiny of America is expressed in our writings, and given the impressive record of accomplishments of this community in the past, we can't help wondering, well, what else, what more in the future? It's very natural for us to do that. Now, these past few months have been in this country more than for a very long time. So I've reflected on this question. And in one reflection, some concepts of the plan, the things we talked about, the path of service, the accompanying, the qualities, all of these things begin to come into, into play. So I wonder, what would things be like in the world If the most powerful nation in the world, the one with most material resources, the one so rich in nation building experience, seriously looked at its relationship with its sister nations to see to what extent these relationships are characterized by cooperation and reciprocity, manifestations of the interconnectedness that governs the universe. What would things be like in this world of ours? If all this talk about our way of life, our democratic values, our know-how, was replaced by conversations that reflect a posture of learning together to build a new civilization. What would things be like when cooperation becomes totally free from imposition? Now, the issue of, at hand is the establishment of peace, because that's the destiny of the nation. And from the messages of the Universal House of Justice, we know that peace is not just making arrangements for, to resolve conflicts and, uh, and question of arms and things like that. We know from the message to the peoples of the world that uh, Establishing peace requires profound changes in the relationships among people and in the economic, political, and social structures of the present world. So 
I ask myself, I've asked myself, what role is the American nation to play in this respect? The government will have to play its role. It has things to do in whatever way about conflict and all of these things. But really, my question has been, what about the people? The nation, not just its government. What attributes do they have to develop? The American people. If they are to play a significant role in transforming the relations of dominance that characterize the life of humanity today, to relations of cooperation and reciprocity, manifestations of the interconnectedness of the universe. Now, given that the nation is not showing much capacity in this respect, <laughs> is it wrong to think that it is in desperate need of the fruits of the learning process on which a small community within it is embarked? Is it too much to hope that the Baha'i community can spearhead a process through which a humble posture of learning and the constellation of attributes that empower the individual to accompany, to accompany others and be accompanied by others on a path of service to humanity become accepted values of a people who have all the resources then to use these attributes to establish peace? So friends, maybe these are the reflections and even just the dreams of an aging man. But if for a moment you see a grain of truth in that dream, then I have a very tough question for you. For all of us, how much are we willing to sacrifice for to get to that vision? <laughs>